Good afternoon, everybody, and we'll call this uh, uh, hearing to order. And I want to thank our witnesses uh, for making a trip to Washington for this very important hearing. I look forward to your testimony. I know some of you have come a long ways, and we appreciate that uh, uh, very much. This hearing comes at a very important time for the international trade community. And last week at the G8 summit in Northern Ireland, President Obama officially launched trade negotiations with the European Union. In addition, Michael Froman was sworn in as United States Trade Representative. It appears that we may have some momentum on the trade agenda, which is welcome news to many small businesses, I know. This committee understands the benefits of international trade for small firms in the economy overall. In 2012, exports of goods and services reached $2.2 trillion, or nearly 14 percent of the U.S. gross domestic product. Those exports provide new sales opportunities, and most important, they help create and, and support good-paying American jobs. Unfortunately, along with limited resources, small firms face a variety of trade barriers that constrain their participation in the global market. As a result, small businesses that do export rely heavily on the negotiated free trade agreements that remove complex trade barriers, provide protection for their intellectual property, and help streamline the trade process. Currently, the USTR is working on a variety of initiatives that will help remove barriers and open new markets for small business exporters, most notably the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and the World Trade Organization negotiations regarding services and information technology. These agreements hold great potential for small businesses, and we must make these negotiations a priority. Earlier this year, the committee drafted a set of trade policy principles aimed at identifying no-cost, common-sense solutions to assist small business exporters. The first principle and the primary focus of today's hearing is developing an aggressive trade strategy to open new markets for exporters. And we can't sit on the sidelines while other countries negotiate trade agreements and put our businesses at a competitive disadvantage. We need leadership from the administration and new USTR to seize these opportunities. Today we're going to hear directly from small businesses about the administration's trade policy agenda and specifically how to help increase U.S. exports and create good paying U.S. jobs. And with that, again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here and I'll turn to Ranking Member Velasquez for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the last year, international trade has emerged as a bright spot in the continuing U.S. Econo uh, economic recovery. According to the Department of Commerce, exports increased 1.2 percent to $187 billion in April, the second highest level on record. U.S. businesses are having particular success selling industrial and telecommunications equipment abroad, while American-made vehicles and auto parts also rose high to a high level of 20, 20, $12.8 billion. Given the critical connection between trade and job creation, this is good news for U.S. workers. With foreign trade on the rise, so are opportunities for small businesses, as they make up 98 percent of all exporters. Recent research confirms this, showing that more small firms are exporting today than just three years ago, while many more are becoming increasingly interested in doing so. For many companies, their success this depends in part on their ability to access these international markets. Small businesses, however, face many challenges. It takes time to identify foreign markets, to target new customers, and to learn the ins and outs of the exporting process. In fact, nearly half of small exporters spend a minimum of a few months a year, as well as an average of 8.4 percent of their annual operating re uh, revenue preparing to export. Compounding this obstacle is that they often have fewer resources to expand on developing a trade strategy or complying with complex regulations. As a result, they consistently enter fewer foreign markets than their larger counterparts, with nearly 60 percent only entering one, while more than half of large firms export to five or four markets. In order to help bridge this divide, there are several tools and resources available to small exporters. The key hook are U.S. export assistance centers, which fill a void by providing access to technical trade specialists in over 100 cities in the United States and 80 countries worldwide. By delivering foreign industry and market expertise, as well as trade compliance assistance, small businesses are better able to navigate the complex terrain of the international marketplace. Another top challenge that small 
exporter phase is securing credit, which is essential to finance cross-border transactions. If banks are unwilling to provide this funding, companies' ability to export will be severely curtailed. To address these very problems, the SBA and the Export-Import Bank provide small business-specific export financing products. Last year, SBA loans generated $1.7 billion worth of small business export, while Exim Bank authorized more than $6.1 billion in financing and insurance for small businesses, a record for the bank. These initiatives are critical, especially during periods when banks pull back on their own lending to exporters. While these nuts and bolts challenges always persist, there is another on the horizon that is even more serious, the weak, that weak global demand could reduce U.S. exports. The recession in Europe continues to put a dent in American sales abroad as export to the European Union declined nearly 8%. With China, the trade deficit rose to $24 billion, the highest level since January and the largest with any single nation. At export to China decreased by 5%. Not only are American exports declining, but imports from these foreign nations are rising as the U.S. market remains a top destination. International trade will always be a complex undertaking, depending on this complex global macroeconomic climate, as well as on country-specific trade policies and resources. Regardless, it is absolutely critical that small businesses are able to participate in this marketplace. Doing so gives them access to more customers, which in turn fuels their growth and employment and that of the U.S. economy overall. I would like to take a moment to thank all the witnesses for being here, and I look forward to hearing your perspective on these challenges. Thank you. And I yield to uh, Representative King for introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to welcome and introduce uh, Pam Johnson, a constituent uh, of mine, but also a friend, and a, a focused and determined and hardworking um, member of the family farm where she and her husband and two sons raised corn and soybeans near Floyd, Iowa. She is the president of the National Corn Growers Association, and uh, also Pam is very active in national and state advocacy groups. She serves as a member of the National Agri-Industry Council Executive Committee and is the current director of the Iowa Corn Growers Association as well. All of that and still time to farm. She's testifying on behalf of the National Corn Growers Association, and I want to thank Pam Johnson for being here to testify today. Thank you for that kind introduction. And Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Velasquez and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about exports and policy recommendations for the U.S. Trade Representative. NCGA, as, as you have heard, I currently serve as president of the National Corn Growers Association. And NCGA was founded in 1957 and represents over 38,000 dues-paying farmers. We support a consistent U.S. trade policy that maximizes corn access, market access for corn and corn products, and does not disadvantage our industry for the benefit of another sector. As farmers, we know that 95 percent of the world's population lives outside of our borders. That is why trade is so important to us and to our nation. NCGA members have much to gain from government policies that encourage exports and facilitate small, family-owned farms entering the global marketplace. The Administration's current trade agenda is ambitious and it is complex. Negotiating simultaneously with the EU and the Asia-Pacific countries will require a tremendous amount of resources and a well-defined set of principles to guide the trade talks. Trade is most efficient when policies are predictable, reliable, and designed to encourage, not hinder, the flow of trade. During my testimony, I hope to emphasize the recommendations that will maximize family farmers' access to foreign markets. Currently, USTR is preparing for the first round of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations. NCGA has called for the trade agreement to be comprehensive and to tackle the significant hurdles that must be overcome when dealing with ag products. For NCGA members, the biggest challenge is the approval of corn and corn products that are derived through biotechnology. 
The EU is a market that holds great potential, but it is often overshadowed by delays in approvals and regulatory decisions that are dictated by political pressure and not by science-based evaluations. Unjustified regulations are costing family farmers millions in lost sales to the EU and could result in even greater losses of U.S. exports if they are adopted by other countries. So we urge USTR to keep the following principles in mind as they begin negotiations with the EU. International trade rules that fully support trade in products of biotechnology for planting, processing, and marketing subject to science-based regulation. We must oppose de facto bans or moratoria on approvals by Europe and other WTO member countries. There is no justification for, members, for measures taken under the guise of the precautionary principle absent the relevant scientific evidence, and politically motivated bans or moratoria by WTO member states are not consistent with the members' WTO obligations. NCGA members do not support a take-what-you-can-get approach to the bilateral agreement with the EU. The Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiating structure should be used as a template for TTIP. This is the best way to achieve an outcome that the food and ag sector can strongly support. TPP is intended to be a comprehensive agreement covering all sectors without exceptions. All topics are to be included as a single undertaking, which means that nothing is agreed to until everything is agreed to. Critically important SBS provisions must be subject to dispute resolution, otherwise USTR sends a signal that family farmers' issues are a low priority. USTR must keep the concept of competitiveness in mind when addressing international regulatory challenges for ag products derived from biotechnology. Trade disruptions caused by barriers to biotech stand to hurt the entire value chain. We encourage USTR to improve the international regulatory environment. Last month, the USDA released its fourth outlook for U.S. ag trade in fiscal year 2013. USDA projects $139.5 billion in ag exports, which, if realized, would be a new record. In conclusion, ag producers succeed when industry and government work side by side. As a farmer, I cannot and should not assume that our industry will be taken care of in TPP or TTIP. It is critical that U.S. negotiators have an appreciation for how increasing exports translates into benefits for family farmers. The U.S. economy will not benefit from ag issues being placed on a to-do list. So now is the perfect time to eliminate longstanding barriers to ag exports and promote policies that bring economic opportunity back to rural America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Our next witness is Brooke Fishback, International Sales Manager at Health Enterprises Incorporated. He is a member of the International Trade Advisory Committee 11, which advises the Secretary of Commerce and the USTR on the small business trade policy. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate or look forward to hearing your testimony. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the Committee, thank you for the invitation to testify at this hearing on international trade policy and for the opportunity to share my views and experiences of our company, Health Enterprises. My name is Brooke Fishback, and I am the International Sales Manager for Health Enterprises, a leading manufacturer and distributor of first aid and other consumer health products, and a true American success story. In the early 1970s, Arthur Lehman founded the company in the basement of his home and sold products door to door to independent pharmacies. Today, still family-owned and operated, we sell our products under our Aculife brand and as private label brands to over 25,000 retail stores here in the U.S. and have exported our products to over 60 countries worldwide. Even with all this growth, domestically and internationally, we are still a small business, with fewer than 50 employees involved in sales, marketing, production and logistics at our headquarters in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. That being the case, and similar to small businesses throughout the U.S., we do not have large legal teams or in-house regulatory departments to navigate complicated international rules for global commerce. Instead, we rely on the USTR to negotiate beneficial, easy-to-understand trade agreements so that we could sell our products to those 95 percent of consumers that live outside of our domestic market. 
First, I would like, like to talk about trade agreements, and I have two points for USTR. Uh, point one, uh, USTR should strive to conclude Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations as soon as possible so that we can begin receiving the benefits of the trade agreement. Currently, around 36 percent of our export sales are directed to TPP negotiating countries. Uh, we are excited about exploring new sales opportunities and would estimate the markets worth tens of thousands of dollars per year in new business. Uh, point two, USTR should energetically enter into transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations. Around 38 percent of our export sales are directed to EU member states, with the U.K. being our top market. Tariff rates between the U.S. and EU are already relatively low, and so the key will be to find common ground as it pertains to non-tariff barriers, including standards and regulatory cohesion. We currently encounter issues of costly and time-consuming re-registration with our FDA-registered products in the European Union. For example, for us to sell a simple finger splint, the kind that you would buy in the first aid aisle of a retail pharmacy here in the U.S., in the EU we need to register the product with the member country's Ministry of Health, which costs several thousand dollars and requires many man hours to complete the paperwork. Second, I would like the USTR to continue to work on leveling the playing field for U.S. companies. For example, USTR needs to ensure that countries to whom we grant preferential duty rates to enter our market under the generalized system of preferences or other programs also grant U.S. exporters equitable access to their markets. Brazil, for example, represents the largest market in Latin America and should theoretically be a good market for U.S. exporters. Problem is, they have high duties, taxes, regulatory and other non-tariff barriers that keep U.S. exports out while we allow low tariff or duty-free access to most Brazilian exports. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to leave you with four key points which will help small businesses like ours increase exports. Uh, point one, free trade. USTR needs to maintain an aggressive trade agenda to assist small businesses in growing their international business. Small businesses are the engines of export growth, and exporting stimulates the economy and creates good American jobs. Point two, trade promotion authority. The President needs TPA for good faith trade negotiations with other countries. Trade agreements should not be renegotiated when sent to Congress, but be subject to an up or down vote. Point three, exporter education. Ensure sufficient funding for the SBA Small Business Development Centers so that they can provide export education for U.S. small businesses. In conjunction, we support your committee's work in exploring additional opportunities for coordinating state and federal trade agencies to assist small businesses. Point four, export promotion. Ensure sufficient funding for the U.S. Commercial Service and, in particular, their overseas offices, which provide the boots on the ground support that we need for market information and which perform the gold key matchmaking service, which arranges meetings for U.S. companies with pre screened potential partners in foreign countries. Ensure that costs for U.S. Commercial Service services, like their gold key, remain affordable so that small businesses can actually participate. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. And it is my pleasure to introduce to the committee uh, Dr. Gary Hofbauer. He is the regional uh, Jones Senior Fellow with the Peterson Institute for International Economics, where he has been written extensively on foreign trade issues. He was formerly the Morris Greenberg Chair and Director of Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Marcus Wallenberg Professor of International Finance Diplomacy at Georgetown University, and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Trade and Investment Policy at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Ranking Member Velasquez, and thank you, Chairman Graves. Um, in thinking about the impact of free trade agreements, on small business, I think it's useful to distinguish between direct exports and indirect exports of these firms. Uh, turning first to direct exports, over 300,000 American small business firms, defined as firms with fewer than 500 employees, directly export goods and services to foreign markets. They number, as, as Ranking Member Velasquez said, 98 percent of all U.S. firms that do any exporting. And they contributed about a third of U.S. merchandise exports uh, between 2002 and 2010. We don't know what their contribution was to services exports. Um, they, these same firms uh, account for about half 
of u s employment so the direct exports are less than their employment share in 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 the u s now turning to indirect exports by small business this is a very important component as suppliers to multinational corporations that export everything from heavy equipment to entertainment software and so forth and these indirect exports are combined with other intermediates and global value chains this is under counted this is under appreciated but to give a rough idea of what is going on the oecd recently conducted a study of the value added in services exports and they found that when we do it on a value added basis services exports are about forty percent forty percent of merchandise exports amongst oecd countries whereas the official statistic is only twenty percent i think if we were able to get data on the indirect exports of small business firms we would find that they are much more important and a big recommendation i have is that this committee press the international trade commission and the department of commerce to do a much much better job on the indirect export angle now turning to free trade agreements they are positive for the reasons my colleagues on the panel have said a recent survey by the international trade commission on korea the u s korea free trade agreement found a generally favorable impression by small business firms standards are an important issue as has been mentioned a very important issue u s firms have done much better in the korean auto market and there are other examples that can be sold now we should expect similar positive outcomes but on a much much larger scale from the trans pacific partnership and the transatlantic trade and investment partnership an important issue again referenced by my colleagues is trade facilitation that is kind of a gooey phrase but it means a lot and to be very concrete and blunt it means cutting down on corruption in a lot of foreign markets which is a big problem for everyone but the smaller you are the bigger the problem and hopefully we will get some progress on trade facilitation at the bali ministerial summit for the wto but also in the t pp in the ttip i would also mention the new study by the world bank on the so called ebay effect when we combine internet everybody knows about that and and ebay and sales and so forth it really cuts the impact of distance on cutting down exports more distance really reduces exports but the ebay effect which is ebay type online services plus ups fedex so forth really does a great job and that's that's important to small business there are many actions outside ftas to help small business i recount them in my in my testimony and and you all know them but i would just conclude by saying that this country is really shrinking in infrastructure i mean really descending you know twenty years ago when i was out of graduate school we were first in the nineteen nineties we were about third and now we're about seventeenth it's just really discouraging because that's a big part of doing business internationally and we are slipping thank you very much our final witness is Mrs. Mariana Huberman, UPS store owner that's here in Washington, D.C. As a service exporter, she advises and assists small businesses with exporting and transporting their products to foreign buyers. Um, welcome to the Small Business Committee and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear before the House Committee on Small Business to discuss some small business recommendations for international trade negotiations. As the Chairman said, my name is Mariana Huberman, and I have been the owner of the UPS store here in Washington, D.C. since 2005. The UPS store network is the world's largest franchisor of retail shipping, postal, printing, and business service centers. Today, there are nearly 4,700 independently owned UPS store locations in the U.S. and Canada. And I am proud to say that my store is ranked in the top 30 in that list. When I decided to open my store, I wanted to provide excellent customer service and critical business services that were lacking in my neighborhood. My staff knows the names of most of our clients, and they know ours. We really consider ourselves to be vital partners in their growth and success. 
Every day, my staff and I deal with small business owners looking to grow their businesses both domestically and internationally. It is our job to make their jobs easier, whether by navigating complex custom rules when shipping their packages, providing a business mailbox to ensure they don't miss important shipments, or printing their marketing materials to grow their business footprint. It is also our goal to become an integral partner to each of them and help them access the global marketplace. However, these customers face a number of challenges when looking to export. For example, we have a couple of art galleries and artists for our clients. We ship their artwork all around the country, and we also try to ship it around the globe. But we run into trouble when shipping to Italy because customs regulations there require that the Italian Ministry of Arts perform a mandatory inspection on all artwork which could delay delivery for, up to a, minimum, I'm sorry, for a minimum of 10 days. Another customer sells non-prescription vitamin supplements and has a difficult time getting those delivered overseas because countries like Australia require import approval from the Department of Health, and Germany requires a German doctor's prescription. In the Ukraine, you not only need a doctor's prescription, but you also have to list the ingredients in English and Latin, and then their intended purpose in Ukrainian. We have a customer who is a potter and sells her items online. We tried to ship a set of coffee mugs to New Zealand and couldn't do it because we needed to provide a heavy metal certificate or have the item subjected to testing by the New Zealand Ministry of Health. We even ran into problems when a customer wanted to send some clothing to a children's charity in South Africa. Once we got everything ready to go, we found out that used clothing is not acceptable in South Africa and that full duties would be applied to any of the unworn items for things being sent to an orphanage. When one of these business owners ships an item overseas, we try our best to determine before we start if their items are going to be held up in customs or not. Once the packages arrive at their destinations, we work with UPS and their overseas customs contacts to clear the merchandise as quickly as possible. It is good to have a partner like UPS to help facilitate trade for our customers, but even UPS continues to face challenges in the customs arena like the ones I mentioned, and any improvements to these systems would be a great benefit to our customers. Small businesses can effectively export to global markets if only there are international rules that enable them and their service firms such as UPS that serve them to move their information, products and services freely across borders. Fortunately, there are several international negotiations underway through which the U.S. Government can eliminate barriers and create new international rules that will greatly expand the opportunities for small companies from the United States. Two important trade negotiations for small businesses are taking place in Geneva, Switzerland. The first is the negotiations in the World Trade Organization on what is called trade facilitation. These are the procedures and rules that, at the border that determine how effectively and economically goods can enter foreign markets. Small businesses cannot afford delivery delays to their foreign customers because they don't get paid until their merchandise is delivered. New international rules are needed to reflect all the changes in the world since the last set of international rules for services was established almost 20 years ago. The United States recognizes this efficiency and last year teamed with other countries to eliminate negotiations on the Trade and Services Agreement. The TISA negotiations could be most helpful to small businesses in the U.S. by establishing open markets and non-discrimination for U.S. service companies enabling to reach the 95 percent of consumers who live outside the U.S. The United States is also negotiating a comprehensive trade and investment agreement with the EU and the so-called Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the Trans-Pacific Partnership with the 11 countries around the Pacific Rim. In both these negotiations, it is important that the U.S. negotiators seek the same high-level ambition as they are seeking in the two sets of negotiations in Geneva. Small businesses are the lifeblood of the American economy and the services are, central, are, the, are the central nervous system on which the small businesses depend. Small businesses cannot penetrate foreign markets without an array of services to support them, and those services must have free access to foreign markets and non-discriminatory treatment within those markets. Given the several negotiations on new international rules, it is timely for the Committee to be holding this hearing today on small business recommendations to the newly confirmed U.S. Trade Representative and the many agencies that participate in these negotiations. Thank you again, Chairman Graves and the Committee, for giving attention to these issues of vital importance to the expansion and prosperity of America's small businesses and their employees. Thank you, Ms. Huberman. Um, we are going. We have got two votes. We are going to go ahead and I think we have got time for one question to start off, which I will I'll turn to uh, and yield to uh, Representative Luke DeMeyer, and then we will uh, recess for a short period and come back. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate everybody's testimony this, morning, uh, this afternoon. It is very interesting. Um, Ms. Johnson, uh, what is the percentage of the corn crop is exported right now per year, roughly? 
Well, because of the drought last year, we have seen a decrease. In 2011, it was 13 percent. This last year was 8 percent. And we know that we have we've lost that market. I have personally been to Korea and Japan and China talking and building relationships, telling them their business is important to us and we want to be back to being their reliable supplier. One of the problems that we have with the uh, EU is the genetically modified corn. Uh, can you describe that just a little bit and what is, if anything is being done to uh, solve that problem? Sure. As I talked about in my testimony, solving the SPS restrictions is a priority for our members in the EU because that is used as a non-tariff barrier to block biotech products. And in the United States, uh, our corn is now 88 uh, percent uses a biotechnology event, as is in our, with our competitors in Brazil and Argentina. We are both up at about the same level. So those SPS uh, restrictions are, are hugely important to us in the EU. You made comment that you liked the Trans-Pacific Agreement. You thought it would be a good template for our, our trade rep to use in his discussions with the EU. Can you get, elaborate just a little bit on the, on the highlights of that that you like? Sure. <clears throat> I think um, the main thing is, as, as, we, as I said, I think the, the big point is that we know that 95 percent of the population lives outside the United States. So using that as a template for TPP and TTIP would help us in a framework that would be workable and to hit the ground running, I think, would help. Uh, Mr. Hoffbauer, you talked about indirect exports and were very emphatic about being um, uh, able to uh, use those or, or to expand those in the negotiations. Would you like to elaborate on this a little bit? Uh, it seemed like you had a lot of good information and were quite emphatic in your testimony about how important this was. I would like to hear a little more about that. Well, well my guess, uh, thank you, Congressman, my guess is that they are as important as the direct exports, but that is a guess because the data is so poor. So we need better data. Now, what, um, what the story of international trade today is increasingly becoming are these vast global value chains, which are really, there is a U.S. EU, there is a U.S. Um, Mexico, Canada, there are Asian global value chains. Africa, unfortunately, is not part of this very much today. But, but behind these global value chains are lots and lots of suppliers, and small business are a big part of those suppliers. And what happens is that these global value chains impose upon their suppliers all the standards that are required in the final market. So all the kinds of things that Ms. Johnson spoke of in the agricultural field or standards in any kind of medical area or any manufacturing, those are going to descend down to the uh, to the suppliers, and if the supplier doesn't meet the standard, it's going to be knocked out of the chain. So how how does this how does this get addressed in, in a trade agreement? The way it gets addressed is by trying to have more objective standards, and the object and one of the announced. So I'm just for me interrupting. But yes, sir. Your first objective standards versus the punitive standards that are set in some of the trade. Uh, well, as no, as, as opposed to. Uh, you know, the big example of the non-objective standard is the precautionary principle, which is basically, you know, we think it's going to harm three generations down so we don't import it. No scientific evidence for that. So, but that's just one. There are a lot of standards which are unique to the country, are not compatible with international standards, and block imports, you know, unless you, unless you meet their, their country standards. So a, a major objective of the TTIP is supposedly to get regulatory convergence between the U.S. and Europe in lots of areas. We have worked over that ground for 20 years without success. This is supposed to be the big initiative. So auto standards, electrical products, you go right down the list, they begin, we either recognize theirs or we have, uh, we converge with them over time. It will be a long-term process. But then that feeds down to suppliers. So if you are a small business firm, to try to make one kind of product with one set of standards for the U.S. market and another for the Korean market and a third for the European market, I mean, you know, that kills you. Financially, that kills you. I headed up a national Basically, academy. Basically, you are looking for standardization in these agreements. Yeah, more standardization. I headed up a committee okay. 20 years ago for the National Academy of Sciences on this, and it is a major, major problem. So that will hopefully be 
addressed to some extent in these agreements. Okay. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will go ahead and uh, recess, and when we come back, uh, uh, Ms. Velasquez will have her questions. And so it will be about 30 minutes, 20 minutes. We will probably be back in about 20 minutes. So. All right. We will call the hearing back to order, and uh, we apologize for the uh, delay. And I will now turn to Ranking Member Velasquez, who we just learned is going to be one of the star players tonight in the congressional softball game. <laughs> <laughs> So and I hope everybody can attend. You? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Hofsberg, as labor costs have increased in foreign markets and transportation expenses remain high, there has been a pickup in reshoring. Um, many U.S. companies, including large companies like Apple and Cat Caterpillar, as well as small businesses, are moving production back to the U.S. Do you expect this trend uh, to accelerate? Uh, thank you, Congressman Velasquez. Um, I think there are two very favorable things for U.S. in the next, uh, let's say, the next decade. One is that we will probably be the low-cost energy country amongst major countries, and certainly uh, by comparison with China or Japan, Europe, we will be lower cost, and that will be very favorable. And secondly, as, you, as your question indicates, um, uh, wage rates are rising fairly rapidly in Asia, uh, not so much in Europe, but in Asia they are, and that is favorable for, for the U.S. So I would expect at least the, the trend to continue and uh, U.S. manufacturing to have a, you know, a fairly good decade going ahead, maybe compared to the decade of the past. But, it's, it, but I, I, I have to add that uh, that productivity in manufacturing in this country is very high. Our growth rates in productivity are quite high, and there is no indication they are slowing down. So it may not be such a boom in employment. Mm -hmm. Sales, yes. Employment, less so. Thank uh, you. What impact would the Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic Partnership have on the economic viability of reshoring? Well, I think there is going to be a lot of this global value chain idea, this all, which is tied in with offshoring and producing goods where they are uh, and services where they are, uh, you know, least cost is, is definitely going to continue, and we're just part of the way down this this historic uh, uh, roadmap. Uh, but the TPP, if it succeeds, will cut barriers abroad very substantially. Our barriers are generally low. They are not zero, but they are generally low, whereas barriers in many countries in the TPP group are, you know, modest to high, especially when you talk about the standards and the behind-the-border barriers. So I think it will mean good times for, for U.S. participation in Asia. And if we didn't have the TPP, I think the headwinds would be much harder for U.S. suppliers. Thank you. And Ms. Johnson, many have questioned the benefits of free trade agreements, arguing that they actually divert demand for domestic goods to lower cost of foreign goods, which produces poor quality jobs abroad. If the Trans-Pacific Partnership is ratified, would U.S. corn growers create more jobs as a result of that, or would the benefits flow mainly to foreign producers? First of all, I, we have to put it in the context of where we think the growth potential is, and, and TPP is focused on a region in the world where we know that the demand for corn and corn products and livestock is really growing because of the growth of the middle class there and the ability to, for purchases and a diet that people want more protein. So this is very important to us. We think it is the, the growth part of our, as we look out to the future, we think it is where we can grow our products and exports. And one in 12 jobs is directly tied back to agriculture in the United States. And if TPP is ratified, we think that it will increase the opportunities for a high demand for corn and those corn products. 
and then so that we will see economic growth on farms as from increased exports and then more opportunities for the next generation. I have mm -hmm. uh, two young sons that are back farming and a lot of their um, people their age are able to come back if there is opportunity to participate in those jobs. And I think that U.S. corn growers, we believe that we can compete on quality. And as I said before, you know, we have been, um, even though our exports have gone down to 8 percent, um, we have been back recreating those relationships so that we can get back in the, in the market and be competitive with other countries who are um, also going after these same markets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Fishback, uh, you spoke about the importance of uh, assistance and technical assistance and yeah. support uh, for exporters, our American exporters. And the recent sequester has reduced uh, funding for the Commerce Department's International Trade Administration, limiting export promotion services and trade compliance assistance. What will the impact of these reductions uh, to small businesses or small exporters will be? Uh, thank you for the question. I think one of the primary things to remember is that um, expenditures on programs that support export promotion actually generate revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of expenditures. I agree with you. Yeah. So it's it's a wonderful thing to actually spend money on because it generates the revenue. So by not spending more money on it, you're going to have less opportunities for especially new to export companies mm -hmm. entering new markets. You're going to reduce revenue for those com potential revenue for those companies. And then on the back end, increase, decrease tax revenue from the increased salaries and, and that you would experience from someone working in one of those companies uh, and corporate income taxes from those companies as well. So by not spending money on it, you are uh, doing great injustice to not only small businesses and their ability to grow, but also to the overall revenue for the U.S. government. Yeah. That's why it's so important it's that very important. we come together in Congress and put an end to the sequestration. Um, Ms. Hoberman, the U.S. is currently part of the negotiations to update rules for the trade in services. Uh, as a business that provides shipping and logistics services, can you discuss how this will impact uh, the franchise directly yours? I think it will impact my customers in a way that makes levels the playing field and allows them to export their goods and services. It will affect my business because I will receive revenue. I will be able to hire more people and pay more taxes, as we were um, talking about, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a good thing, for me anyway. Uh, but that's, that's what it is about. It is about leveling, leveling the playing field for all of the small businesses who can't get their products overseas. I mean, the delays that we have with getting just simple things delivered is just ridiculous for things like, you know, the reasons like the ones I mentioned earlier. And what is the practical impact of these delays on s small exporters' uh, bottom line? They don't ship. They don't do it. They, they rather give up the sale mm -hmm. than deal with those delays because they end up looking bad to the customers on the back end and or their uh, items might spoil or they'll get Sometimes a lot of things get lost in customs, um, depending what countries you are shipping to. Things just happen to disappear um, once they get into the hands of customs officials overseas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Mr. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if uh, the panel could um, uh, just briefly answer this. Uh, uh, if you think that uh, the U.S. economy and small business uh, exporters in particular in particular, are better off with a free trade agreement in place or, or worse off? I want to uh, maybe start with you, Ms. Johnson. Well, as we look at the competition and we see that uh, all the free trade agreements that they have been making with different countries, I, I think that we have to be um, also to be competitive, that we have to be in the game also. And so those are very important to us. Whatever trade agreements they are, as I said, our, our future is dependent on being able to export. You know, small business is the engine that makes uh, the United States work, and and so true for farmers also. So we see, as as I said, we're only five percent of the population in the world now. So our growth potential depends on good trade policy. And FDA. Mr. Fishback. So. 
free trade, I think the last statistic with free trade agreements is that we actually have a trade surplus with any countries with whom we have a trade agreement. Uh, having a trade agreement in place for a small business exports uh, only increases our ability to increase our sales in a given market because it reduces our costs and improves the avenues that we have for actually facilitating the trade. Uh, the more free trade agreements, the better, from my perspective, for a small business. In fact, I was just in uh, South Africa in uh, uh, a month and a half ago, doing a gold key service in Cape Town, and the president came out with his uh, doing business in Africa campaign last year, but didn't back it up with that with any support for small businesses. So, while I was there, found out that the European Union has a trade agreement with South Africa, which could reduce some of their tariff rates by 20 percent versus mm -hmm. the ones that I'm paying. And so, if we're going to come out with some type of an agenda item like that, maybe we should back it up with with exploring new fr free trade agreements for companies to help us out. Mm -hmm. Mr. Humpau. Uh, thanks. I, I, I think that uh, free trade agreements are a very big plus for, for small business. There is a lot of evidence that uh, trade internationally is much smaller than it is domestically, and uh, there are a lot of barriers, and free trade agreements tend to cut into the barriers. The one additional point I would make <clears throat> is that um, it is really too costly and too cumbersome for a small business firm to bring uh, a dispute under a trade agreement. These things, these disputes that you read about, the, the legal costs start at $100,000. And you can quickly marshal up, mar match, you know, uh, <clears throat> march up to a million dollars. And so what the government should do, in my opinion, and of course it will require money, is be more aggressive on looking at barriers which adversely affect small business and bringing cases on their behalf. GE can take care of itself, but small business firms cannot. Ms. Huberman. I can only speak to it, on it from a practical, everyday interaction with my customers, and I can tell you that the trade deal we have with Canada makes my customers' ability to get their products into Canada much easier than any place else right now. Well, I want to thank you all for your um uh, testimony here today. I think that uh, uh, small business is the engine that, that certainly that drives economic development in this country, that drives uh, job creation. And so I think whatever we can do uh, to facilitate more export markets, uh, particularly for small business, uh, uh, it, I think is such a plus for the U.S. economy. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just really happy to hear all the stories of small business exporting, and, and you're right, 95 percent of the people are elsewhere. Every small business wants to grow, and I think every small business wants to export, and most of them don't. They, they look at it, they, they know they should be doing it, so I guess Mr. Fishback is somebody who sells, you know, what you sell. What would, uh, advice would you give to that small business person, and what role does our free trade agreements play versus just the, all the regulations of getting started? How do they get started? Well, that, that's a great question. And your committee is actually working on some things to, to assist that by looking at uh, ways to take government resources and blend them together to make more clear points of contact for companies that want to start exporting. And it comes down to education, making sure that there's channels for those companies to get education on exporting, uh, which comes through uh, looking at what we currently have in place with states and with federal governments, finding ways to bring the state and the federal government together so they can work together to train these people so that they are able to do it. Um, in looking at that, uh, our belief is that the SBDCs uh, in the states do the best job of the initial counseling. Uh, with companies that are new to export or wanting to export. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have the Mass Export Center that does a fantastic job and should potentially be considered a, a model for the nation. Uh, and then once they have got that understanding of how it works, it is basically the, you, a template that you can follow into other markets um, and then bring in the, the UCACs and, and the commercial services well to help out. <clears throat> do, do you think finding a partner, I mean, in, in, in some cases the government helping you find that partner in, in that first key export market where you can get your product over there, but you have got somebody doing the heavy lift, lifting is key to a new small business 
putting their toe in the water? That, that's a huge, huge amount of assistance. Um, I did three gold key services here uh, already this year using the services of the U.S. Commercial Service and the commercial attache at the embassies overseas. Um, it provides companies with access to a, a group of pre-qualified companies that they wouldn't normally be able to get in front of. Uh, working with the U.S. government provides instant credibility for these new export companies, uh, and it works. And, and one of the, the points that, that I made in my testimony was that um, the U.S. Commercial Service is looking to increase costs on small businesses for their international services, and if they do that, then small businesses won't use them because they will be too expensive. Uh, and for us, by using them, we have seen and experienced uh, quick and good sales growth. For example, it was in New Zealand uh, about, a month, about a month ago doing a gold key service in Auckland, uh, signed up a new distributor right away. The gold key cost $700. We have already had around $14,000, $15,000 in sales from it. Um, so you already see the revenue generation that can happen from it. So those services, the boots on the ground overseas, are essential for our companies to be able to compete. Good. Thank you. One, one other uh, interesting thing is we look at the TPP, and there is concern, I think, with Japan and their currency and, and their situation with the value of their currency dropping. And I have heard folks talk, you know, at what, what role does the trade representative play in the currency world in free trade versus Treasury? I wonder, Mr. Hupbauer, if you got a, just a thought on that? I could give you a three-hour dissertation, but that is not what you want. No, we have one minute and 20 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> the turf between USTR and Treasury is closely guarded. Treasury does not want USTR to be involved in this area. They have been very explicit on that. When I was in government 30 years ago, same story today. Um, but there is growing recognition that the currency issue is critical uh, in trade agreements because of the argument, you know, currencies can drop 5 percent overnight. You spend three years negotiating tariffs down. So I expect this will play a role in the TPP and maybe in TTIP as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony. It is not always an easy thing to leave your busy lives and come here to help advise us on, uh, on the path that we need to take. Plus, sometimes it just puts us in a position where we are given advice on down the line as well. But I, um, I was interested in what I heard in your testimony, Mrs. Johnson, um, when you were speaking, I believe, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership on it being a, asking for a comprehensive agreement. And I like the language, nothing is agreed to until everything is agreed to. And I wasn't clear whether that also applies to TTIP as well as TTP, TPP. Excuse me. Thank you for that question. Yes, it does. I, I think that is a key point that you picked up on, is that it has to be compre comprehensive. And so that we said that um, it, it will be a template for TPP, so a comprehensive plan on TTIP and then comprehensive plan on uh, TPP also is, I think, one of the most critical recommendations that we would give about going forward. And then to embellish that point, when I sit down and talk to the Europeans about trade, and I do a fair more of that than I ever thought I would coming into this job, they are constantly trying to pull us back from why don't they say, they say why don't you exempt GMOs and then we will apply our sanitary and phytosanitary specs to your things and then we can go ahead and do business. I would guess that you have been in some of those negotiations uh, I have just described. Could you describe some of that for the panel, please? Well, I think the point that you bring up is, and, and my point in the testimony is, that it has to be a comprehensive uh, package that uh, we can't leave certain things out to renegotiate later because it will come back to really hurt agriculture. So, you know, SPS has been used in the, in the EU to prevent a lot of our ag products, a lot of our corn products, uh, livestock issues, our production practices here. They have used the SPS against us. So um, I believe it is very important that we make sure that we don't leave anything off the table. We do it right the first time. And, and I point out also that it is really interesting that I can sit down with, we will say, German intellectuals, industrialists, or agriculture people, and they all come to the same point. It is agriculture that is our barrier in our trade. And most everything else we seem to be able to get worked out, but agriculture is a barrier. Is that your experience too, Ms. Johnson? 
Yes, it is. And, you know, I am still hopeful once in a while you hear something optimistic about the comment out of the U.K. now that maybe that the E.U. should take a different look at biotech. So, you know, we are still very hopeful that that will happen. And as America's uh, National Corn Growers Association, we have been working with the corn grower associations in Brazil and Argentina saying, yes, we are competitors, but there are certain things that we need to uh, collaborate on, and it is just what you are saying is the trade barriers, the trade disruptions that are due to biotechnology and modern farm practices hurt everybody and uh, curtail the ability of agriculture, no matter where you are from, to be able to grow in a glo global marketplace. Uh, I recall as uh, GMO Roundup Ready soybeans um, came to the fore in Argentina, but not Brazil, but they found their way across the border and essentially washed over the continent. And uh, now I see that um, the European Union seems to be the citadel that's locking those products out. And um, I think that they're going to end up being um, be they'll, they'll be the last stand, but eventually productivity and the demands of that and the health of the food will become apparent. I spoke with a elected member of the German Bundestag who uh, represented a region. I better not say where because I'll identify him then. But he said I agree with you that there's no sound science that says that GMOs are um, a risk to health. But we have to take this position. And I said, why don't you just take my position? He said, well, I can't do that. I'm elected. I said, how about I'll go with you and I can take this position and you can nod your head. And he said, I would be voted out of office. Um, it is a political position that has grown. And the Green Party, for example, in uh, some countries in Western Europe doesn't exist anymore because it's been so absorbed by the other parties. It's not true in every case. But I think we have to just keep pushing the GMOs and push the sound science that we have. If we do that, then eventually this trade component of this thing will wash over that continent and we will get it done. But I wanted to turn quickly to Mr. Fishbach, and you mentioned regulations and how difficult it is to fill all the paperwork out. Have you compared what, how difficult it is for someone who wants to export to the United States when they fill out our paperwork? Are we also putting the barrier up like that for them? That, that's a, a great question, and I have not had the opportunity to do that, but my natural reaction is, they must be doing something if they are not going to budge on their end. That's, um, the clock is run down. I appreciate all the witnesses. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Hanna. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Hoffbauer, you mentioned, uh, to pick up on what Ms. Velacqua says, a ranking member, uh, things that encourage other companies to come back. Um, you mentioned energy, which is yet to be seen, but clearly on the horizon. You mentioned productivity. I'm going to ask you two questions. One, what other things are there? I mean, as an economist, what other items specifically are there? And then I want to dig a little deeper. In your testimony, you talk about transportation and how other countries are so far ahead of us. Uh, and I wondered if you could be more specific about both of those items. Uh, the reasons companies are coming back besides those two and how big a barrier and how big a problem transportation is and how you might quantify that for me. Thank you, Congressman. Let me start with your, the, the last point on, on transportation. Um, the way this is typically measured is the turnaround time in ports uh, and the uh, cost per container. Uh, no one is better than Singapore on both counts. Singapore's cost for handling a container, about $400 is a standard container, and the U.S. is about $1,800. That is a big difference. The turnaround time in Singapore, but also impressively in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and a few other ports around the world, you know, that is 24 hours. We are not there. We take longer. Long Beach is, is really congested, and you can go right through a lot of ports. You can find their turnaround times. The World Bank does this. And we are we're up in the days, and that's, that adds to the expense. And then we don't have the intermodal transportation we should from some of our ports to the inland. The rail doesn't connect as efficiently as it should, or the roads for the trucks don't connect. This, you know, we are we're way behind. And not just Asia, we are behind Netherlands, we are behind the U.K. We are not good at ports the way we were, you know, years ago comparatively. And we are behind Canada. So that, that would be my comment on transportation. On air transportation, cargo, we are quite good. We are 
not maybe the best, but we are very high on that. And obviously, for increasing the amount of trade done by Internet and so forth, we are top of the game. So that is you know, a big plus. Um, now, as for, for other factors that are going to favor the U.S. economy, well, let, I don't want to be all negative, but one way, another way we are relatively losing, not, not in absolute sense, but relative to other countries, is our educational system, as I'm sure you've heard many times, is not uh, keeping us far ahead of the competition. And, there's, and there are a lot of things in technical vocational education and so forth where we can learn from other countries. But still, we are tops. But others are catching up with us on the education, engineering, science, the whole, whole lot of it. Uh, but still, we are tops. And we do produce an extremely wide variety of products and goods and services, which other countries don't usually have that same variety. And that is a great strength of the U.S. because you can have these networks which combine all these uh, inputs. We are very inventive in terms of you know, biotech and medical and so forth and so on. Those are our strengths going forward, and I think they will, they will prevail. And other reasons why companies might come here that once looked to leave? Well, it is those strengths. I mean, let me just be very specific. On technical vocational, the Germans pioneered this. They linked up their equivalent of our technical vocational schools with companies. We are now doing that. Mm -hmm. That is a reason companies will locate here, because they can get a, a, a college, whatever it calls itself, to train people for what they, the very specific kind of either computer or mechanical or whatever that they need. And that that's a big, uh, a big reason to be here. In terms of labor relations, you know, every country has difficulties from time to time, strikes. Our strike rate or labor disturbance rate is very low compared to other countries. You, you have a good workforce in this country. And, and that's, that is a big plus. And, you know, we are not tops. Tops in terms of honesty for countries goes to Finland. But we are not too far down. We are like five or six on the, on the World Bank rankings. And that means we are a very honest country. And that makes a lot of difference to, to companies who don't want to have to deal with corruption. Thank you for, for that, sir. I yield back. I, think I have one question. As far as the U.S. Uh, trade representative goes, how would each of you grade uh, his performance in terms of working with small businesses uh, to try and improve some of the prospects out there? I don't really have a good answer for that because I, I don't know enough to comment on it. But um, one thing I, I would like to say is that I think good trade policy is really necessary to move everything forward for all of us. And I was asked earlier about um, jobs and how important that is and how important it is for the USTR for us in agriculture. And um, we form partnerships with uh, public private partnership with the government for uh, market access programs and foreign market development. And so those statistics from that is every billion dollars that's, that we have in ag exports that the USTR helps us with supports approximately 6,800 U.S. jobs. So extremely important to us, that position. Yeah, I would say that they have um, done a good job in the last couple of years of reaching out to small businesses, um, even creating small business liaisons within different departments to specifically address the needs of small businesses. Now, the key is that that continues. Now, we have a new uh, trade representative uh, who follows the President's agenda but also has his own uh, line items that he wants to run through as well. So the key now is that they have started to reach out to small businesses more, uh, which we appreciate. Uh, I think that just needs to continue uh, moving forward. I'll be a little more negative. <laughs> the USTR is absolutely overwhelmed. Our trade ministry, compared to the trade ministries of other countries, is very small. And the budget was cut, as uh, Ranking Member Velasco said. And they're suffering from the sequester as well. I was recently in Surabaya. And I don't know if you travel to Indonesia very much. It's a long trip. It's an exhausting trip. I was fortunate to go business class. 
the U.S. reps went economy class. I mean, that is a tough trip, and they are exhausted when they get there. They are younger than I am. They, they marshaled through the meetings. There is an APEC meet, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting. You know, this is amazing that we do what we do with the budget that we give, that we as a country give USTR. And I just don't think they have enough resources to do what they are supposed to do. And certainly I would think they need more resources to do a proper job for small business. And Chairman, I appreciate you asking me the question, but I really don't feel qualified to answer it. Mr. Hillskamp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, Ms. Johnson, in particular, as a, a farmer, good to see you here. And, uh, and I look at our ag exports and the opportunities out there. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. And as we discuss a farm bill, I hope we continue to look forward uh, to the export side of the equation because that's uh, tremendous growth and, and result in prosperity for rural America. Whether it be corn or other, uh, or other commodities, uh, where do you see as the, the, the best prospects uh, for uh, ag exports uh, around the world? It is a great question. And I think it is one thing that we are very optimistic about is the potential for growth for rural communities and farmers and all ag exports and corn and coal products, so corn and DDGs and livestock, especially now when we are looking at um, countries like China considering what food security means to them and what they have to do and what they have to learn from us, uh, possibly the Smithfield purchase. And that will translate into many dollars worth of exports, whether it is raw grains or it is meats. So I, I think that potential is, is huge. And as we look, um, before you came in, we talked about how we are 5 percent of the world's population now. So if we are going to look at what our future is going to look like, we are going to have to figure this out. So I really appreciate the committee's uh, recognition about how, how important exports are to small businesses, including agriculture. And in your opinion, I appreciate that, Ms. Johnson. In your opinion, uh, whether it be the U.S. Uh, Trade Representative or other offices, uh, do you think they do a, a, a sufficient enough job uh, promoting ag exports? Oftentimes, uh, those of us in ag country uh, feel that uh, perhaps it is not high on the agenda for these uh, big negotiations and uh, happens to get lost. Uh, you know, past administrations have uh, clearly not been very supportive of agriculture. Uh, but uh, I'm just curious at your current take on, on the efforts and negotiations. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. And that's why I'm really thankful to be at the table today and to be able to give input on what our recommendations would be going forward with TPP and TTIP is because we think they have to be comprehensive trade agreements and that uh, no single thing is agreed to until everything is agreed to and how important it is to agriculture now that that framework is established going forward, um, I think is critical to making these trade agreements uh, fruitful for the future of agriculture and the future of rural America and small businesses in general. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, whether it's uh, the beef industry, which is uh, very big in my district, uh, uh, wheat, uh, which uh, half of it uh, leaves uh, uh, leaves the, the country generally and numerous other products. I mean, it is what's driving uh, growth and prosperity in rural America is that ability to export and feed the world, fuel the world in some cases, and, and clothe the world. And I appreciate the chairman's uh, bringing folks in here to talk about that uh, because it has an impact, obviously, on, on some of the, the very large uh, businesses in this country. But for the very small businesses, it is amazing of how highly dependent they are on export markets, uh, whether it is uh, another 20 cents on the uh, price of bushel of corn or whatever the numbers are today. It makes an incredible difference in rural America. So I appreciate uh, your testimony. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hoffman, and I will invite for any uh, any one of you to in the panel to make uh, to comment, but given the fact that we, here we are discussing the important role of small businesses as exporters, um, they represent 98 percent of all exporters are small businesses. Um, 30 percent of the revenues uh, they they represent 30 percent of all the revenues when it comes to uh, export import. And uh, 60 percent of small exporters uh, enter one market, and in that market, only one customer. So there is so much that can be done to increase uh, the role of small exporters. My question to you is, 
uh, we have the office of the USTR. And in that office, we don't have anyone that whose solely responsibility is to be at the table whenever we are negotiating any trade agreements that represents the interest of small businesses. I couldn't agree with you more. It's, you know, they're, 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 they're stretched, but if, if you want it to happen, you have to kind of legislate it on a line item basis or something to have the kind of people, they might come from the Small Business Administration or whatever, who are delegated to um, USTR to really zero in. And, and the problems of the, for example, the, the, the health care products industry might be quite different than the pro problems of, uh, say, uh, the software, the small software producers and so forth. So they, the person or persons have to have some industry expertise and really have to drill down into the into the barriers. I, I won't go on at length, but I did review a thesis from a very able PhD student at the Hebrew University a couple of years ago who looked into small business representation in the WTO and found it was it was lacking. Generally, it's not just the U.S. Generally, small business just doesn't get the attention it deserves given the potential that you have outlined. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Fishman. Yeah, I would, I would echo those remarks. I think it's essential, as you mentioned, uh, just based on the statements that you made, that we have a seat at the table. The small businesses have a seat at the table during these trade negotiations. I know recently, um, I mentioned Brazil previously as a problem market for uh, small business exporters. I know that recently there was a fed Federal Register notice to try and get a, a small business executive uh, as a part of the CEO forum. So at least that's a voice at the table, but to the extent that you have a, can have a small business government official at the table advocating on behalf of small businesses. Mm -hmm who, like, like members of the panel, understands what it takes to, to run a small business is, is essential. Ms. Jones. I think as Congressman Hulskamp outlined for us that certainly in these new huge opportunities in trade, we do not want agriculture left out of the picture as it has sometimes in the past. So I um, would appreciate a voice at the table and make sure that the agreements because agriculture is so important to our country, it is also important for the growth of our country. And I, I know you outlined some good points, but it is also the way we are going to bring the next generation back, not just to farming, but to small businesses and all those processes that go down the line for value-added um, processes and products, whether it is livestock and, and corn products. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I want to thank you all for um, participating today. This committee is going to continue to make sure that the uh, small businesses are a priority, uh, priority for the U.S. Trade Representative during international trade negotiations. And we have invited Ambassador uh, Froman to address our committee on the status of the negotiations and how the administration is working to help increase exports for small businesses. And we look forward to hearing uh, uh, or hosting him, I guess, uh, later this year. Um, but with that, I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and support any materials for the record. Um, with that objection, that is so ordered. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.